Good morning. It is a pleasure to be with you, and I thank Mark for his uh, kind introduction, and I better tell you what that other job is that I did. Um, in, uh, after uh, teaching at Westminster Seminary in Philadelphia, we moved to uh, Michigan, and there I owned and operated a dairy farm while I was also teaching at uh, Calvin Seminary. So. Uh, uh, it was fun for me flying in from Chicago low enough to be able to look at all the farms and it, it, I was kind of hanging almost out the window just uh, being able to, I mean it was a magnificent view of, of the crops and how everything was organized and this is my first time to Iowa and you hear about the, the ground in Iowa, right? The, the ground, there's no ground like Iowa farm ground and um, boy it sure looked like it was well kept uh, by the farmers here in Iowa. So it's a pleasure to be with you. And uh, it has, it's been a long time uh, since uh, I've seen the farm machinery out as we were coming in. There was a, a shame on him for doing it today uh, before church, but there was a John Deere tractor with, I mean, all the wheels were out and I just about got a whiplash trying to watch it as, <laughs> as we were going, going by. It was the biggest tractor I've ever seen. So I, I had a, a little John Deere, uh, for those of you who have tractors, anybody know what a 4020 is? <laughs> okay, I mean, we're talking a long time ago. So that was my tractor, and it was, it was a big one. It could pull five whole, by, five whole plows, right? So uh, for you guys, that's nothing. But it's a pleasure to be with you. And uh, I do thank the, uh, the elders and Dr. Larson for the kind invitation. We're going to talk about uh, John Calvin and uh, the Reformation this morning, and I want to start uh, a little before Martin Luther. This is the 500th anniversary of Martin Luther nailing the 95 Theses to the church door in Wittenberg. And I want us to step back in time to imagine what it was like 500 years ago in Germany to, uh, to be a normal uh, German. So over 90% of the people were farmers. But unlike today, a, a full family farm would be 40 acres. But also unlike today, most of the farmers were not owners of the land. There were the great lords who owned the land. And the, the, the towns would, uh, the, the farmers would live in the town and would have to walk out to the farms where, where they would work. And again, just thinking about that great big tractor that we saw on the way in, to plow one acre took eight head of, ox, or eight head of oxen and about eight men to handle the eight oxen with one wooden plow. And that effort would get you one acre in one day. So that's um, when you hear about the plowmen, uh, uh, they would be plowing uh, not all year round, of course, not in the winter time, but um, they had crop rotation and they knew uh, about manuring the fields. And uh, so livestock was important, taking care of the livestock, and it was highly intense work in terms of manpower per acre. And so that's why 40 acres was a was a decent family farm. It would take uh, a family full time just to be able to keep that number of acres uh, planted. So here you are, you've been working in the fields and from the time the boys are 12 years old, uh, they're expected to put in a 12 hour day, uh, six days a week. And you get your day off on Sunday and you come to church and you hear the mass in Latin. Now that's helpful. Right? I mean, nobody understands a word of what's going on in church. And the priest can do magic. Now, again, you, you, no one goes to school. No one can read. I mean, no one. That 90%, there's no one literate. You speak your German dialect and every, every part of Germany had different dialects, so you could tell where someone was from by their dialect. But you didn't leave your part, because 
and you couldn't get into your Chevrolet and drive down the street, you would walk. So uh, you would walk into the fields and you would walk into the, uh, the town and if you were visiting someone, you would usually walk. Uh, the peasants didn't own horses. So you go to church and you don't understand a word, but you know you're to take the Eucharist or the Lord's Supper and you're told that that helps you to get to heaven. Now, uh, as I think about life in the medieval church, I think of, about it in terms of an American football game. Now, uh, last night when I was in the restaurant, Penn State was playing some other school. <laughs> and I asked, uh, I didn't stay up late enough to see who won. I asked uh, Dr. Larson who won. He didn't know either. But Penn State was playing somebody. And uh, there are certain rules to a football game. So everybody, um, you know, was cheering when it was first and ten, and I was sitting there grumbling, uh, you know, because I, I, like, I like Penn State. I'm from Pennsylvania. And, uh, and you know that if you take the ball and you carry it so far, you get a first and ten, and then you get to do it again, and you do it again until you reach the goal line. So if you think of life like this football game, the goal line is heaven. And God gives you these opportunities for first and ten through the Lord's Supper. It's in a sense, the, you know, you're running the ball on the ground and maybe you get two or three yards and you just, you just keep on being faithful. But at the end of the game, you have a final sacrament called extreme unction, which means extreme, uh, you're at the end of life and unction means oil. So at the end of life, the priest comes and anoint you with oil to give you that, you know, that last push to the goal line. The problem is when, you, when life is over, you think that you're you know, first and three at the goal line and you're just about over and St. Peter says, son, you didn't make it to the 50 yard line. So you just never know how far you've advanced in this game toward the goal. And uh, that the church couldn't give you any assurance as to where you were on that football field of life. And so Martin Luther, who had been preparing for a job as a lawyer, which would advance his family in terms of social structure, met a crisis in his life and made a vow to become a monk. And he has this saying, he says this, doubt makes the monk. Doubt makes the monk. So if you want to make that touchdown, the best way to do it is not get married, but go into the monastery because you get extra first and go, you know, first and tens. You get, uh, you complete some passes. So you go into the monastery hoping to work your way down the field, but it's you cooperating with God that gets you down the field. And that's the system of salvation into which Martin Luther was born. And it was, uh, uh, we see through the woodcuts and the paintings and the narratives that we have from the 16th century, the, the portrait that I'm painting is an accurate one. There was, uh, there was fear especially as people would get older and they would be closing the end of their days. They, they wouldn't know whether they were going to make it. But the church created sort of, uh, you know, to use, to switch sports metaphors, if we go to hockey, there is a penalty box. Now, again, I'm not a sportsman, uh, but, and if I get things wrong, somebody correct me, okay? But, I know in hockey, uh, hockey I, I watched a fight in a hockey game gro broke out one time. Sorry, that, that was supposed to be funny. All right, so uh, there are penalty boxes in hockey and, and the players are put there and they have to cool off for a while. So the church invents a thing called purgatory. And if, you know, if you've been pious and you're within the 20 yards of the goal, uh, you can go to purgatory 
and continue to earn salvation so that maybe you can then be good enough to make it in heaven. And purgatory, of course, could last hundreds and thousands of years. And it wasn't a nice place at all. So here's Martin Luther. He's now ordained as a priest. And he is a, he's a German priest. And he's ministering to German people. Again, the vast majority are, are serfs who farm. And he loves his people. And in comes a group of preachers who sell what's called indulgences. And this is what's going to bring on the 95 Theses. And indulgences are for a certain amount of money, you can buy grandma's way out of purgatory. So grandma may have been pious, but you don't think that she went to heaven because she wasn't a nun or she didn't live in a convent because she's your grandma. And so, you know, for a, a few small coins, you could relieve her, say, of 100 years of purgatory. And what was happening, these serfs who, who were on a subsistence diet, in a sense, one day away from famine, they were giving their last pennies to the indulgence preachers to save a dearly departed family members. I mean, you think about it um, in terms of your own family. If, if, in fact, the claim is true, which, which the people believed. I mean, the indulgence preachers would come in and they would, they would literally have papal uh, proclamations on uh, sheepskin that would say, you know, this guy really can do this for your family. I mean, wouldn't you do it? We would, we would all do it. But Martin Luther, the pastor, sees the people as sheep, uh, and he's the shepherd, and they're giving their last pennies to, to get you know, these indulgences, and, and Luther just doesn't believe it's true. Luther says, well, excuse me, Mr. Pope, if you can you know, give these indulgences, why do we have to buy them? If you've got a treasury of indulgences, why don't you give it away? Just freely give it away. And of course, Luther knew that the money was to build St. Peter's Basilica in Rome. So Luther, in, uh, 500 years ago, writes these 95 theses, and it's all about the theology of the indulgence and how it's bad. The problem for Luther is this. The Pope was in favor of the indulgence preachers because the money was going directly into his coffers. And to, to stand against the indulgence preachers is to stand against the, the institution of the papacy. And so the Pope is going to respond uh, violently against, against Martin Luther. So the real issue of the Reformation was a pastoral issue. It's not some kind of you know, theological issue. It's uh, the Pope is doing wrong to my sheep. And I love my sheep, and I don't want to see them hurt by these indulgence preachers who have a very lavish lifestyle themselves. And they're sending money back to Rome. And, and the, uh, Luther had seen the lavish way in which the Roman hierarchy lived in contrast to the peasants who are working 12-hour days and barely making a living at all. So that's the inauguration of the Reformation in 1517. And from that, it continues to build and, and continues to grow as Luther begins to look at the theology of Rome. He begins to say, you know, I've been, I've been called as a teacher of Bible and a preacher, and I read the scriptures, and I see what's going on in the church, and there's a disconnect. There's something desperately wrong. And during the sermon, I'm going to uh, preach from uh, one of the passages that was so important to Luther from the book of Galatians concerning what we have in Jesus Christ and the glorious gospel of free grace that we have in Christ. And Luther was convinced that, 
We don't have to buy anything from anybody. Salvation has been won for us by Jesus Christ 1,500 years ago. And through faith in Him and His blood shed on the cross, we have free forgiveness of sins. And for us as Protestants, that's, that makes perfect sense. But it was a radical new message. So that's in 1517. Things are stirring up in Germany by uh, 1521. The Pope has completely excommunicated Luther. There's no turning back. But the people, the, the peasants, um, uh, began to hear the Bible read to them in German. And they began to hear the gospel. And, and brothers and sisters, think about it. The Holy Spirit used the uh, translation of the Bible into German and uh, the opportunity to hear the gospel in their own language. The Holy Spirit used that and many, I mean hundreds and thousands of people came to saving faith in Jesus Christ. So they didn't want to go back to the papacy. They wanted to continue to hear sermons in German. It was the bread of life. And uh, the collected works of Luther are about this big. I mean, the guy was preaching four or five, six sermons a week, and, and the church was packed because people had come to, to faith, and they were like starving people ready to eat the word of God that was being uh, preached to them. And, the, and that preach word began to spread throughout all of Europe. Meanwhile, down in Switzerland... There was another man by the name of Ulrich Zwingli. And uh, he had come to saving faith uh, through a, a different avenue. And it was a different story. But uh, the, the two reformations are going to synapse. So there was a movement uh, called the Renaissance. And, uh, and Zwingli uh, was also well educated. And he had learned Greek. And uh, he wasn't saved, but he was a priest. So... Uh, it, Clearly, uh, he, he had not come to saving faith. But as he's reading the Gospel of John in Greek, he got saved. Because he just read the Bible. And also remember, uh, you could be ordained a priest, but you're still not allowed to read the Bible. It, it was against the law for the priests, certainly for the lay people, but it's against the law for the priests to read the Bible because it was too hard for them, according to the church, to understand. And the official version is in Latin. And to be a priest, you actually didn't have to know Latin. You had to be able to memorize the mass, but you didn't have to know what you were saying. So uh, many of the priests had never read the Bible. Here is Zwingli, who had actually not read the Bible in German because it didn't exist in German. He's reading it in Greek, and he got saved. And he starts preaching the same kind of message, except the, the way he did it was fascinating. When the people would come uh, into this center of the city uh, to the market, so twice a, twice a week, the farmers would come in and sell their vegetables, and the people would buy their vegetables. Uh, Zwingli would stand on the corner of the market and start, uh, he literally stood on a, like a, an orange crate or a soapbox of some kind, and started preaching in, in German to the people, and they started to get save, saved as they came to market. And then the, the word would start to spread, and the same thing was happening all throughout Switzerland at the same time as it was happening up in Germany with Martin Luther. So the Reformation is starting to spread all over the place. And it was spreading so much, say, 10 years after the 95 Theses, there's a meeting between the German Lutherans and the Swiss reformers in 1529 in a castle uh, in the little city of Marburg in Germany where uh, because the Catholics uh, considered the Protestants heretics, one of the problems of being a heretic is that in the legal structure of the time, if the Pope pronounces you a heretic, then your nobles, if you're the king, your nobles can rise up against you, take over the throne, because as a heretic, you're, you're determined to be not qualified to rule. 
So there were, uh, there were political ramifications to the Reformation itself. So the, the, the nobles of, of Germany and the cities of Switzerland wanted to form an alliance against the Catholics because war was inevitable and war will eventually come as the Pope and his armies would war against uh, the Protestants and that'll, that'll occur over decades. As a matter of fact, in 1532, Ulrich Zwingli will be killed on the field of battle uh, in, a, in a, uh, a major battle between Catholic Swiss forces and Protestant Swiss forces. And fascinating, he was, um, as he was uh, found on the battlefield, he was killed twice. Um, he was, uh, are you ready for this? He was cut into four as, as a traitor and then they uh, burned what was left of him as a heretic. So uh, this was serious business. By 1529, Europe is in flames because of the Reformation. And in 1529, John Calvin was probably still Roman Catholic. So uh, I know this is the teacher part of me, but I'm gonna stop and, and ask, have I been clear? Do you have any questions? Um, don't hesitate. Uh, it's all clear in my brain, but between my brain and my mouth, and my mouth in your ears, and your ears in your brain, there, all kinds of things can happen. So uh, questions, comments, or challenges, it's, it's more important for me to be clear than anything else. Anybody? So I'm crystal clear? Well, that's good. Okay. So 1529, uh, uh, we have that meeting. 1532, Swingley's dead. So uh, we've already finished the first generation of Protestant reformers in Switzerland. And in 1532, Calvin begins to make his appearance on the field. He's, he's born in 1509, so he's very young. And he had his first publication, which was what we called a, would call a humanist work, um, just a scholarly work. And in those days, it was possible to, excuse me, to have a career as a scholar, as a writer, and people would support your books and you could become rather wealthy. You wouldn't have to do anything else. You certainly wouldn't have to milk cows. Oh, I'm sorry, that, that was <laughs> attempt number two at humor, okay. 1532, uh, he uh, puts out his first scholarly work and he intends to live the quiet life of a scholar. Um, he has tremendous academic uh, gifts and abilities and he never planned to be a priest. As a matter of fact, John Calvin never went to seminary. Now, if any of you young guys are thinking about the pastoral ministry, don't follow Calvin's lead on this. Going to seminary is a good thing unless you have an IQ of it like 200 or something like Calvin did, and he could study all that stuff without going to seminary, but he, he, he was a lawyer. So Luther never finished being a lawyer. Calvin actually became a lawyer, never went to, uh, to seminary at all, and wrote his first book, which wasn't really a Christian theology book. And uh, as he's, as he's, uh, observing things as a Frenchman, not as a German, he's seeing that the German, excuse me, the French government has taken a strong stance against Protestantism and the, uh, the French king is uh, burning uh, Protestants all over the place and Calvin, uh, Calvin wants to write sort of a handbook to the French king to say, look, you can be a Protestant and still be a good Frenchman. And that handbook is what we call the Institutes. But when it first came out in 1536, it was, uh, it was not, it, it was bigger than this, but you could still put it in your pocket. Um, it, it was something that you could carry with you. It's not the big two volume thing that you see of Calvin's Institutes. And it was, uh, it's, it's a handbook for basic Christian uh, teaching, but especially that the, the king of France would stop killing the Protestants. So Calvin has written this, and uh, he still wants to be a reclusive scholar, writing books now as a dedicated Christian. 
and he's making his way into Italy when he has to make a detour into Geneva, Switzerland. And of course he's known as Calvin of Geneva, Switzerland, but uh, he, he is a Frenchman in terms of his citizenship. And as he's spending the night in a uh, Best Western hotel in Geneva, Switzerland, he gets a knock on his door from a guy named William Farrell. And William Farrell had been doing uh, Reformation work in Geneva, and he needed some help. So Farrell was doing the same kind of thing that Swingley was, had done. He's preaching in the marketplaces, and by this time, probably 50% of the city, or a little bit more, had come to saving faith. But there are, there's no one to preach. I mean, there's him. But now literally thousands of people had come to saving faith. And uh, how's he going to minute? I mean, he's doing this on his own. So here comes this French-speaking evangelical into his town. And Pharrell says, you're going to stay here. And he does it in a very persuasive fashion. He basically threatened Calvin with divine condemnation if he didn't stay. And later Calvin wrote, I heard the voice of God in the words of William Farrell, and he, he could do nothing but stay. That was his call to ministry. So Calvin and Farrell together, hand in hand, uh, began to organize uh, the church in Geneva and in a peaceful fashion they started to dismantle the whole Roman Catholic structure. Um, uh, they began uh, quietly to remove like the icons from the churches and uh, nobody went to mass any longer, the Latin mass. They would, uh, people uh, uh, literally uh, came to saving faith and so the church, uh, Pharrell would preach in one church and Calvin would preach in another church and, the, and it would be standing room Standing room only, uh, people would, were just packed. Um, the city council itself became Protestant. So the city of Geneva legally determined that it would be Protestant. Now one of the differences between Germany and Switzerland is that Switzerland never had a king. Switzerland never had a prince. I mean, never. There's never been a king or a prince of Switzerland. The cities in Switzerland are what we would call independent city-states. So uh, the great city of Zurich, where uh, Zwingli was, had a, had a mayor and a city council. Other cities like Basel and Bern, uh, the present-day capital of Switzerland, uh, no king. Uh, they had uh, powerful families, but no actual noble families. So that in the city of Geneva, if the city council determined that the city's Protestant, then it was Protestant. And they did it by vote. And fascinatingly, the vote was not so much the peasants, but the men who were wealthy enough to be able to afford a sword would come into the center of the city and you would vote by raising your sword. So having, owning the sword, which would cost you know, literally hundreds of dollars, which the peasants couldn't afford, uh, owning the sword was your sign of citizenship and you would basically count the number, and if there were enough, uh, that's how Geneva became Protestant. So that inaugurates the Reformation in Geneva. The Geneva population determined that they uh, were going to be Protestant. The situation is different in Germany. In Germany, the nobles determined whether the province would become Protestant. So if your noble got converted, in a sense, by you know, if this side of the room uh, you're all under uh, uh, Lord Mark and uh, Catherine, right? Lady Catherine, is, uh, she's the noble of this side of the room. Well, Lady Catherine, of course, gets converted. And you guys uh, haven't heard the gospel, uh, but you're under her, uh, her lordship, and she says, all right, now you're all Protestant. Hey, you'd have no idea what that means, but you go, yes, my lady. And Mark, of course, is hard-hearted. And you guys, you guys are staying Catholic. But you people in the back all got saved from hearing Martin Luther. But because 
uh, Lord Mark is still Catholic, you can't, you can't go to Protestant service. So there's an inherent tension in Germany that you didn't have in Switzerland. So if a city decides to stay Catholic, the majority stays Catholic, you could, if you were Protestant, you could leave and go to another city. So there was a, a lot of flexibility in Switzerland uh, that, that we didn't have in Germany and it was actually easier for the Reformation to establish itself in Switzerland and especially in a place like Calvin's Geneva where the city legally became Protestant. So as, uh, of course, Calvin had some troubles while he was ministering in Geneva. I mentioned that uh, under Pharrell, 50% or a little bit more uh, came to the Protestant faith. Uh, within a year of Calvin's uh, being there, the vast majority of the city of Geneva uh, had come to saving faith, but not everyone got saved. And a lot of the people in Geneva who uh, didn't come to saving faith were the powerful families. So after two or three years in Geneva, both Pharrell and Calvin were thrown out. Now, again, thrown out uh, is, is the best way to understand it. They were given 24 hours uh, to leave, uh, but actually the, the unsaved people became so angry they gave them about 12 hours and they threatened them uh, with swords because, again, the wealthy people, uh, the army of the city of Geneva was the, the elites of the city of Geneva. Men who had been trained in how to defend the city. I mean, there was no, you know, there's no national guard, there's no army. It was the Genevan citizens themselves. So a significant number of Genevan citizens who wanted to remain Catholic uh, said, we're going to kill you if you don't get out. So they, uh, they took everything they owned they, got, they were given two horses, they were given saddlebags, and everything Calvin owned had to be put in these two saddlebags. And Pharrell left and went to another town called Neuchâtel and never came back to Geneva, and Calvin had no place to go. So he's, he makes his way around Switzerland and he's going to uh, find a safe haven for a while in the city of Basel, and that's, uh, that's where I lived for three years. But what's fascinating is that the Rhine River runs through the city of Basel, and at that time the bridge was out, and his horse was crossing the Rhine River. The horse lost its footing and drowned out from under Calvin. And with the horse were the saddlebags of everything Calvin owned, including all his correspondence. So we have no letters to or from Calvin from uh, until he's mature because they all went down the Rhine River on the back of the horse and Calvin climbs, uh, climbs up the, the bank of the city in his wet clothes, completely impoverished, and uh, that's the nature of his life. So you think about a young man uh, in his 30s and he has already realized that to stand for Jesus Christ can mean life and death. He's seen Frenchmen burned at the, at the stake. He has seen the warfare within Switzerland between the Catholics and the Protestants. He's known what's uh, been going on in Germany. And both Martin Luther and John Calvin will live as men who have the death penalty placed upon them. So if John Calvin ever went back to France, any French soldier, any French nobleman who could capture him could immediately execute him without trial. The king himself had condemned him to death. And the same applies to Martin Luther. Both the pope and the emperor had declared Martin Luther dead. So that only while his Remember, uh, Lady Catherine is his, the Protestant protector. As long as Lady Catherine is Protestant and protecting Martin, he's okay. But if a bad Lord Mark comes over and can get his hands on Martin Luther, Luther's dead. So both of those men lived with the psychological baggage of knowing that there are people intent on killing him.
And you can imagine the stress that that would produce in your life and the intensity uh, by which you view your Christianity. So both of these men uh, saw the, the Protestant faith as something to die for. And uh, their task was to protect their people and uh, feed their people and do whatever they can for the advance of the gospel, uh, advance of the gospel, uh, the spread of the gospel through writings especially, but through uh, preaching. Uh, so Calvin, like Luther, preached four sermons a week all of his life. Now, I think that you should expect that of Dr. Larson as well. <laughs> Um, you know, one or two is kind of chintzy. So four sermons a week should be the norm uh, for pastors. <laughs> okay, that's a joke. That's a joke. Uh, but given the situation with uh, so few preachers and so many people who wanted to hear, they would uh, go to the different parts of the city so that the different people uh, could hear because not everyone could get into the church building at the time. So that's the nature of the, of the beginnings of the Protestant Reformation. It was a time of absolute life and death. It was a time of great papal darkness. The, uh, the mass will stay in Latin until the 20th century. The Pope doesn't want the people to understand what's going on. He wants them to obey. And, uh, and, and until the Second Vatican Council, I mean, to be a Catholic means to obey what the priest teaches, what the church teaches. You don't have to understand. For us as Protestants, of course, uh, obeying Christ is what's important, not necessarily obeying, uh, well, what the church says. I mean, the church needs to say that which is right, but Christ has to come first in all areas of life. So Calvin and Luther have uh, their hand in hand in, in almost all of these theological points. And they, uh, they both want radical changes for their people and for their countries. The, the Roman church had brought darkness into every area of life for the last hundreds of years. And so everything needs to be changed. And uh, later uh, this afternoon, after, uh, after our morning worship and our lunch break in the second hour, I'm going to show some of the ways in which, I'll focus ex exclusively on Calvin, some of the ways in which uh, uh, the Lord Jesus Christ, through the servant John Calvin, brought about great changes and how uh, some of the things that we take for granted as that which is normal is a direct inheritance that we've received from the 16th century. So uh, please come back for the second hour. Thank you very much. Um, do we have a minute for questions? Or, uh, uh, just a quick question again, if I haven't been clear especially. Yes? That's right. Yes, it, it's, it was a combination. So the, the, without the printing press, there'd be no Reformation because the leaders and the shakers could read Latin. So that, say 10% of the population could read Latin. 10% of the population had the money to be able to buy uh, booklets and buy pamphlets. So that was an, an important part of it. But again, 90% of the people could neither read nor write. So the only access they had is through the preached word or the spoken word. And uh, oftentimes people would get together, say one family could buy the Gospel of Mark. And so the extended family would come and, and uh, they would have someone who could read, read it out loud. So uh, the spread of the Gospel was basically by mouth. Yeah, excellent. Any other questions or comments, please? Yes, ma'am. So the Marburg Colloquy had a, a statement of faith that was 14, uh, there were 15 points, and they agreed on 14 and two-thirds. 
And the, the one part where they couldn't agree was on the nature of the Lord's Supper. And that divides the Lutheran from the Reform to this day. Uh, I'll try to do this in 30 seconds. So for the Lutherans, um, uh, you have to have the bodily presence of Christ in the bread and wine, similar to uh, Roman Catholic teaching. In the Reformed tradition, uh, we, we don't say that the bread actually becomes the body of Christ at all. And Luther considered that to be heretical. So Luther actually said to the uh, to Zwingli and Bootser, the Swiss delegates, that you are not Christians. And Luther refused to shake their hands and acknowledge them to be believers. At that point, Swingley, who was uh, actually physically a large man, fell on his knees and wept and begged Luther to acknowledge him as a believer. And Luther refused. He said, you're a heretic. So there was a complete break between the Lutheran and Reformed at that uh, colloquy. And today, if you go to a Missouri Synod or a Wisconsin Synod Lutheran Church, if you're from the RCUS, they will not serve you the Lord's Supper uh, because you have a false understanding. So it's still, uh, to this day, a, a point of difference. Yes, in the back. How soon after the 95 Theses did the actual Eucharist or the Mass become um, part of the communion as the Lutheran would say or the Lord's Supper to us? How, was that a long process? Was that dealt with immediately or did that work? Long? Well, let me see if I, uh, uh, let me give an answer and then if I'm like totally messed up, do it again, okay? So Luther changed the mass from Latin into German and calls it the German mass. So the early Lutherans still celebrated the mass with just a slight difference understanding uh, the, the change of the blood and the bread in, in, the, in the supper. So he still considers it to be the mass where in the Reformed tradition, we have the Lord's Supper. So almost immediately in the Reformed tradition, we have the Lord's Supper and the Germans stay. And so uh, for, through the whole 16th century, German worship is called the German mass, uh, Lutheran worship. Now, did, did that get the question or not? Okay. I think maybe time is up. Thank you very much. Pleasure to be with you for the second time. And uh, let's uh, begin by remembering what happened in the first hour. So we began by talking about life in the church in medieval Germany and the problems inherent in being a Roman Catholic during that time and the problem of the football game. Do you remember that? And you not knowing uh, what, you know, how close you are to the touchdown when, when life ended. So Martin Luther um, saw that problem as a pastor and as a professor understanding the scripture and the Reformation began in Germany as well as uh, in Switzerland with Ulrich Zwingli. We went to the Marburg Colloquy in 1529 and saw the beginnings of a rift in the Protestant movement on uh, the, the point of the Lord's Supper and the proper interpretation of the Lord's Supper and that's uh, one of the things that distinguishes the Reformed churches from, say, the Missouri and Wisconsin Synod Lutheran churches uh, to this day. We saw uh, Calvin and Pharrell being thrown out of Geneva, and uh, uh, Pharrell went to the town of Neuchâtel, from which he never came back to Geneva, and uh, we had Calvin, I think, being washed up on the shore of Basel after his horse slipped, you remember that, in the Rhine River, and, and he lost his saddlebags. So according to my memory, which uh, isn't always the best, that's where we ended at the end of the first hour. Does that seem to be about right? Okay. So let's pick up and focus more now on uh, uh, Calvin's ministry in Geneva and some of the changes that occurred there. While he was um, not able to minister in Geneva, he went to the city of Strasbourg, which uh, is in present-day France. Uh, 
although it's actually a German-speaking city, and to this day the Strasbourg dialect is the same dialect as the Basel dialect, so they can understand each other, even though they're in different nations. And Calvin went there to minister to French speakers in the German-speaking city of Strasbourg, which is in present-day France. And uh, it was a wonderful time there. He went there as a single man, and he met his wife and got married in Strasbourg. And uh, he was ready to stay in Strasbourg. As a matter of fact, Calvin was given citizenship in the city of Strasbourg, which he never ended up getting in Geneva. Uh, but that's uh, another story. So he's in Strasbourg, and he wants to stay there. But remember the, the Libertines. I don't know that I gave you the name of the people that's, uh, that had Calvin and Pharrell thrown out. They're, uh, they're called the Libertines. They were in favor of exercising their ancient liberties, like drunkenness. And, um, and Calvin and Pharrell stood against that. So as the Libertines took control of Geneva during the two years when Calvin and Pharrell were out, Remember, the majority of the city had gotten saved so that the majority of the people, uh, they, the people who came in to f replace uh, Calvin and Pharrell were uh, ready to obey the Libertines where Calvin and Pharrell weren't, and the preaching went down the tubes. So that the people who had gotten saved said, wait a minute, uh, we don't like this new regime, we want Calvin back. So there was a struggle in Geneva to have Calvin back, and they kept sending messengers to Strasbourg, can we have Calvin back? And Calvin said, no, no, I don't, I don't want to go back there. And uh, as they were negotiating, Calvin said, all right, if, we're, if I come back to Geneva, it's under these conditions, that I get to rewrite the entire constitution of the city-state of Geneva. I'm going to begin at the beginning and rewrite from ground zero not just the church regulations but the city regulations and suddenly the fact that Calvin had been trained as a lawyer instead of as a preacher comes to the fold because he knew how politics worked and he, uh, he wanted a city that was the, the, uh, I was talking to somebody just a minute ago, I don't know if he's here, but we were talking about Angus beef. And, and he was saying that when you, you have to have a good genetic foundation for a good Angus cow. Well, a city needs to have a good constitution to be a Christian city. And, uh, and Geneva agreed to that, and that constitution was the operative constitution of the city-state of Geneva until the 20th century. So uh, he wrote an enduring uh, constitution that, uh, that restructured Geneva itself. So he came back to Geneva. And by the way, has anybody ever gone to Calvin College or seen Calvin College or heard of Calvin College? Have you seen the symbol for Calvin College with the heart and the flame? Well, Calvin had no symbol. But it comes, uh, it comes from a letter between Calvin and Pharrell. Calvin didn't like the way he was treated in Geneva, didn't like Geneva, loved Strasbourg. And so uh, they're writing back and forth, and, and Pharrell says, are you going to go back to, G to Geneva? And in the letter to Pharrell, Calvin says, and this is uh, Rick Gamble's translation, because it, it may be a little even more risque than I'm going to say, I'd rather be dragged through the bowels of hell, that's really what he said, than to return to Geneva. <laughs> But if the Lord calls me, promptly and sincerely, I'll obey. And so that's why we have this prompt and sincere as the motto for Calvin. Um, and, and that's really a motto for Calvin's life. It's better to obey God than to do something that's pleasurable. So uh, Calvin goes back to Geneva, begins the next Sunday on the next verse in the, in the passage where he had stopped two years earlier when they threw him out, it's like, I've never left. I'm going to start right where I left off two years ago with a new constitution where everything had been Christianized. Um, so to be a citizen now in the city of Geneva, you had to be a member of the church. And you had to be a member of uh, the Genevan uh, <coughs> Protestant church, you know, member of that church, so that citizenship and 
membership in the church were coterminous, which helps to uh, make sense. You know, here in America, we have a mixed society. Um, there may be a lot of Christians in Iowa, but you can't say that Iowa as a state is a Christian state. There's no state that's a Christian state like that. But the entire city had promised now to, uh, to be Christian. Now, that doesn't mean that the Libertines go away right away. Uh, there's going to be continuing battle, but uh, that was the condition of Calvin's return. And with that, Calvin began new social structures that had been unheard of in European history. So, uh, for example, Geneva, and uh, like Switzerland, I mean, uh, I shared with you in the first hour how I enjoyed the plane ride from Chicago coming in and just seeing the rich farm ground. Now, if you haven't been to Switzerland, you've seen pictures. And what does Switzerland have for natural beauty? Mountains. Well, mountains are beautiful, but you can't grow corn on mountains. Now, you've seen those Swiss cows where the two legs are shorter on the one side as they go, or, you know, they walk around the cow. Okay, that's a joke. That's a joke, too, for the non-farmers. So, uh, so you don't have the natural resources that we have here. And uh, so Geneva's best industry was uh, pleasure and, and entertainment. So prostitution, for example, was one of the major uh, means of livelihood for the female population. And uh, clearly, that was a wicked field. So what's Calvin going to do? Uh, uh, prostitution, for example, was banned. And uh, what he had was the, the young women who were engaged in prostitution were all taught a craft. And th that became the hallmark through the Swiss cities. So for example, the city where I lived in Basel, um, uh, prostitution was made illegal and the women who had been engaged in that learned how to make ribbons. And actually, the ribbons of Basel were the most expensive ribbons in Europe for a couple hundred years. And it grew directly out of the Reformation, where the women uh, had no skills, and uh, that was the skill that was learned, and it ended up being a predominant skill. So and not only was prostitution ended, but for example, the finest playing cards were made in Geneva, and it was a family that had done that for generations, and that family was told uh, no more playing cards. So the men in that family learned how to be water engineers. And they worried, uh, they, there was a big lake, Lake Geneva, and the dams and stuff became the responsibility of that family. And so the, the entire family business was changed. So it wasn't just that preaching was encouraged. The preaching was encouraged. And in Geneva, you could go to a church service seven days a week. They didn't just preach on Sundays. So the different churches within the city, on Monday there'd be a church service, and on Sunday there were three different services um, uh, with two different sermons, so that uh, if you know there was a dawn service uh, for some people, and then especially if you came in from the countryside and you had to you know, do chores before you came in, there was a second morning service for uh, the farmers who came in, and then an evening service as well on Sundays. Plus, throughout uh, the week, if you lived in Geneva, you could uh, attend different sermons. And remember, no, uh, people can't read. So uh, you go to church, and you can hear the preached word of God. But I've been emphasizing how people didn't read, and that was one of the other big changes in Geneva, when Calvin came, he began to institute what we would call a public school. Now again, all of us uh, have been trained in public school or home school or Christian school, and we, we consider it something that's normal. But this was not normal at all, and for the, for the first time in European history, the very first time in all of European history, women got to go to school. So up until this time, uh, any kind of public education, women uh, were not given the right to it because there was a very low view of women during that time. As a matter of fact, Martin Luther didn't believe 
I don't want to say it, but it's true, that women bore the image of God. Only men bore the image of God. And Calvin had harsh words against Luther on that. Um, as they both wrote Genesis commentaries, Calvin uh, demonstrates that women, like men, were created in the image of God. And concerning Luther, he says, and some say, with no foundation, that women had to the image of God. It was Martin Luther, in fact. <laughs> So, uh, so women were trained uh, through the eight years of public school the same as or girls, the same as the boys of the city. And furthermore, there were radical social changes concerning laws. So in issues of adultery or issues of fornication, in the medieval church and in uh, Luther's uh, uh, understanding, the culpability lay mostly with the woman rather than with the man. The woman was the temptress. And in Calvin's Geneva, in fact, uh, men uh, became completely liable. I mean, women weren't ignored. But uh, Calvin switched the emphasis to uh, the men uh, who were involved in these affairs. And uh, men ended up going to jail. Uh, instead of uh, only women. So there was a tremendous social change in Geneva, and it was so radical that people from all over Europe uh, saw the change, and of course the Roman Catholics thought it was ridiculous, but it became a bright light for Protestantism throughout, uh, throughout the world so that people from England and from Germany and from all over Europe came to Geneva uh, to both uh, study and live, and it became a place of refuge for uh, people near and dear to Presbyterians like John Knox. Um, John Knox called Geneva uh, a sort of heaven on earth. Um, people then were now taught to read. Calvin was convinced that all members of the church need to have access to a Bible and have the ability to read the Bible. Another change occurred um, in the churches that, once again, we take for granted, and that's singing, congregational singing. Up until that time, there were professional choristers who would sing in the mass. And of course, if you can't read, you can't read music and you can't sing. Calvin and Farrell uh, had these words to say about Geneva. When they first started to, in, to institute congregational singing, Calvin described singing in these pissy words. They sound like cats having their tails stepped upon. <laughs> so if you've ever stepped on your cat's tail, you know the uh, awful sounds. And, and what they did in the schools is they taught the children how to sing. And the children could then go home and help mom and dad warble out a sweet tune. And uh, so we, we sang uh, this morning in uh, worship from the Scottish Psalter, one of the Psalms, which comes, in fact, from the Genevan Psalter before that time. So Calvin uh, had the city council employ a poet, a guy named Moreau, who took the Psalms and put them into meter and uh, then they began to sing the tunes. And once again, the tunes were just common tunes. So uh, the Catholics and uh, the English uh, Anglicans, for example, called the tunes the Genevan jigs. Um, they, were, uh, they seemed kind of boring to us, but they were the popular songs of the day. So Moreau took the words of the Psalter and uh, they put them to... Uh, tunes that the people knew and understood so that congregational singing, for example, in Zurich with Zwingli, Zwingli was a, actually an accomplished musician, but he, prohib he prohibited singing. He didn't know what to do. He knew that having the, the choir sing uh, sort of entertainment wasn't good, but he didn't think that it would, he could pull off teaching the people to sing, so he just forbade it. And it was like that for 75 years in Zurich. Uh, but in Geneva, they started to sing the psalms as, as a congregation. And eventually then, you know, as you know, singing sticks in our minds, right? Um, you can uh, talk to people, uh, elderly people will remember the songs of their childhood more than what happened last year. 
and uh, songs uh, singing the the Genevan Psalms became a part of uh, French-speaking Protestantism. So those are some of the changes that occurred uh, on Calvin's return to Geneva. I've been blabbing uh, quickly and for a long time, so let me stop and see if I've made sense and uh, see if there are questions, comments, or challenges. Uh, it's made sense to me, but again, I don't know that I've communicated well. Questions, have I been uh, speaking clearly or comments? Or a clarification, please. I don't see anybody seeking the floor, so that means. Okay. Yes, ma'am. Did, uh, Did Calvin, I'm sorry? Oh, that's a good question. Oh, that's a good question. Let me do that one. I promised Dr. Larson a story at lunch, and, uh, and I could see I was really frustrating. He wanted to know the story about Calvin, and, uh, a part of the story of Calvin and Luther, and I said, you have to wait for the lecture. <laughs> so, so let me tell the story. One of Calvin's best friends was a guy named Philip Melanchthon. And Philip Melanchthon was the number two guy to uh, Luther. And Philip Melanchthon was a great uh, trained humanist, uh, as, was, uh, as was Calvin, instead of a priest like Luther and was a little bit younger than Luther, as was Calvin. Calvin was more than 20 years younger. And they had met at a number of colloquies, and we have quite a number of letters between them. So toward the end of uh, Luther's life, Calvin and Melanchthon had been talking about the nature of the Lord's Supper. And remember in the Marburg colloquy, it was the Lord's Supper that brought the split between the Lutherans and the Reformed. And Calvin had convinced Melanchthon of Calvin's view on the Lord's Supper. So uh, just very quickly, in the Roman Catholic Church, the bread is transformed into the actual body of Christ. In Luther's understanding, it's not transformed, but it's conformed, so that, the, that Jesus is in, with, around, and through the bread, but it doesn't become his actual body. Now that difference is so subtle, most people can't understand it, including me. Um, and I've asked a number of Missouri Synod Lutheran guys to explain the difference to me, and it, it sounds more like mumbling um, than really uh, something substantive. So uh, Calvin's view is not the, a bare memorial at all, but Calvin's view is that in the Lord's Supper there's a true transformation but it's not the bread and the wine. Calvin says that when we have the Lord's Supper, we transcend time and space. Now that sounds like seminary stuff, but when we understand what he meant, it's very clear. In the Lord's Supper, it's not just the pastor and the elders who are presenting the body and the blood. It's by the eyes of faith, Jesus Christ himself. And by the eyes of faith... We leave, we leave Pittsburgh or we leave Iowa and we're swept up into heaven. And that's the transformation. The transformation is of the congregation rather than the bread and the wine. And as Calvin made that clear to Melanchthon, Melanchthon said, this is good. This is, uh, this is what we should, should have. So, so John Calvin wrote a letter to Martin Luther on the Lord's Supper. And Calvin hoped dearly that this could bring about a, a union between uh, the two groups. Gave it to Melanchthon to give to Luther. And then Calvin heard that Luther died. So he writes frantically, again, we have this letter. He writes to Melanchthon, Melanchthon, did you give Luther the, the letter? And Melanchthon says, no. No, I'm sorry, John, because I just couldn't take another beating. You see, uh, Luther, um, as a medieval thinker, um, in those days, again, showing the cultural differences, the father could freely beat his wife and his children. And Luther, as the father, saw everyone else as a son. And in fact, any time Melanchthon would get uh, under Luther's skin, he would beat him. <laughs> 
And so he was actually, uh, this is in the letter, I'm not making this up. He was afraid of being beaten again by Martin Luther and, and was afraid to give him the letter. So he never received it. So that's, that's the story, Mark. Calvin set up a, a graduate school like a seminary uh, in Geneva. Calvin was the main teacher, but they had a full faculty and uh, the men were well trained. And they went back into France to do mission work and then to pastor the small enclaves of French Protestants. But because the government itself refused to ever acknowledge Protestantism, they were always persecuted, sometimes more, sometimes less. And as you can imagine, uh, uh, when there were nobles who actually became Protestant, so you've got you know, this Protestant side of the, of the room right now, and you've got the Protestant lady who's protecting you, so as long as she's in power, she'll protect the congregations in her, uh, in her province in France, even though you've got a strong king who stands against you. But uh, over here, if there's a small congregation under a, a Catholic lord, they'll be persecuted. And uh, this is a, a sad part of 16th century history, but it's true history. The French government, in conjunction with the papacy, had developed a elite core of servants to the French government who we would call assassins. And these were uh, professional men who had been trained uh, in the military arts. And when uh, in this, you know, you've got this Catholic nobleman, when the Catholic nobleman would hear that one of you guys uh, was pastoring the French congregation within your town, you would have the king send one of the assassins to the pastor's house. And uh, the, the, mo the MO, the modus uh, of uh, uh, the assassination, would be for the assassin to break into the pastor's home at night and kill him in bed. He couldn't do it in the open during the day because the members of the congregation would protect him. But at night, he was, you know, there was no ADT alarm company. And uh, at night, he was vulnerable. And so that was um, the way in which the pastors were assassinated. Now, that sounds like it may be kind of a unique and one-time uh, one time happening. But from the first day of the establishment of the seminary in Geneva until Calvin's death in 1564, one third of all the graduates of Calvin's Geneva within three years of graduation were murdered. One third of the class. So if you've got a class, again, you think of your own uh, high school or college class, you've got a small class of, say, 20 people, within three years, six are already dead. And it didn't end throughout Calvin's entire life and ministry in Geneva. So imagine, remember Calvin, I said, is a dead man walking. He's already condemned to death in France. But in those days, usually the men who went to seminary weren't married. And there weren't any dormitories. So the students usually lived in the homes of the professors. So imagine your classmate, and for me as a professor, this is very emotional. Imagine having your students come live in your house. And if you have a fight with your wife that day, the students know about it. If you yell at your kids, the students know about it. That, you know, you can't really hide much when you're having three meals a day together. You train them, you eat with them. And the whole time, you know that in the past, this persecution had been going on, and you don't know the future, you hope for peace, but as you've been training them, you don't know whether you're going to be sending them to their death. Furthermore, furthermore, you would 
uh, you would give to the graduate, by the way, uh, we've, we have 20 volumes. We've transcribed the minutes of the consistory in Geneva during Calvin's life. And we've done that in the last 15 years. And they're now in English. Uh, we have all of these details in the consistory minutes. Furthermore, when, you, when the guy would graduate, he would usually get married. And we, uh, uh, the pastors had with them, just like uh, during the time of the American uh, Civil War and slavery, you know, we, we talk about the Underground Railroad where the slaves could go. Uh, we have now records of the safe houses throughout France. So if you send them, uh, the pastor to, you know, this part of France, if something happens, his wife can go from this city to this city to this city to make her way back to Geneva where she can be safe. So we now know, for example, oftentimes when I speak about Calvin, people ask about Calvin's library. So we've got Luther's library, we've got, but there is no Calvin library. And to explain that, when, when the widows would come back to Geneva, Again, I'm not making this up. This is the truth. Calvin would get a knock, a knock on his door. And before him would be a young woman in her blood-soaked nightgown with her children at her hand. And she had a piece of paper and said, this is Calvin's house. This is where you go when you make it to Geneva. And it was Calvin's responsibility to to provide for sheets and a place for this family to stay when they first arrived in Geneva. And oftentimes, he didn't have sufficient funds to pay for them, so he had a deal with the bookseller around the corner. He would take a book from his library and pawn it to the bookseller, get money, and use that money to go to the merchant to get the sheets and the bedclothes for the woman and her children. And then when he got more money back from the city council to buy his book, it might be gone, and he'd buy another copy or it would be gone. So that's why there's no Calvin library. His books were just flowing to pay for the refugees. And it never changed. It never changed. So imagine, dear brothers and sisters, imagine what it's like to meet the young woman that you've never met before. But the young man had lived at your house for three years. And you had a close bond to him. You had, you had sent him to death. So, um, Calvin's known for his institutes. But this is a part of Calvin's ministry that to me is more moving than the institutes ever could be. To, uh, he offers his heart promptly and sincerely. He put his money where his mouth was for himself, but I think more painfully, for his students. And they paid the ultimate price. And a number of years, of course, after Calvin's death is the famous St. Bartholomew's Massacre, where the King of France, in one 24-hour period, killed over 2,000 Protestant Protestants in France. The great slaughter that began in Paris and went to the four corners of France. And effectively destroyed Protestantism in France from then on. There's still some remnants there. But that's, uh, that's this, the story of uh, the evangelistic work of Calvin in France. And sometimes people wonder about Calvinism and evangelism. You know, why aren't Calvinists better evangelists? Well, uh, we should be better evangelists. Calvin was a great evangelist. He was utterly committed to uh, spreading the gospel of Jesus Christ to those who were perishing. Let me stop on that. Um, uh, for me, this is highly emotional. I can, I can, I've been doing this um, talk for a number of years, uh, but I'm usually fighting tears by the end as I'm doing now, and I'm not so sure that I've been clear. So are there questions or comments on this uh, last, last point? Questions of detail or further elaboration would be fine as well, or challenges. Certainly, it's a sobering notion. Yes, I see a hand. I'm sorry, I'm getting older, and I heard sort of 80% of that. Did Calvin get 
Uh, Did he get thrown out twice? I can only remember once, but maybe there was a second time. Uh, he, he, uh, he, he sure got in trouble a lot. So, uh, while he was in Geneva, remember those, liber those libertines? So the libertines made sure John Calvin never had citizenship. And uh, even though some biographies say that in 1559 he got citizenship, I think they're wrong. So uh, let me give one more story about uh, Calvin getting into trouble. But he didn't get thrown out on this one. So although Geneva had agreed to be Protestant as a city, again, all of us know what it's like to work with hardened non-Christians. And clearly not everyone was saved in Geneva. And uh, toward the end of Calvin's life, the Libertines became desperate. And they were so desperate. Remember, the Libertines are the ones that are the elites. So they're the men of arms. The, uh, the captain of the city guard was a Libertine. And they decided to take over the city council by force of arms. And so they gathered in one part of Geneva and were going to march toward the, uh, the city council building in the center of the city. Calvin's home and study was close to the center of the city. Meanwhile, some of Calvin's supporters knew that they were coming and they were very glad to pick up arms and fight against these other guys. So here comes these two groups uh, toward each other in Geneva. Calvin is in his study and he's not feeling because he, he, he had all these infirmities. So oftentimes he would stay in his jammies studying. He hears about the Libertines coming down towards Center City, goes flying out of his study in his jammies. And uh, there's one, uh, uh, one person here who's an elder who's a, a little bit short. And I won't point to him or anything, but he's not sitting over here. But he's short, you know. There's another one who's really, really short up here with the camera. And, and this morning, uh, uh, now I'm short, right? So here is short Calvin coming to this big captain of the guard. Uh, Calvin is not big. The captain of the guard is this powerful man. And the captain of the guard has his sword and also has a musket, a little flintlock musket. And Calvin comes running up to him, puts his face right against the chest of this guy. And he says, Sir, if blood is going to be shed this day, mine will be the first. And he stopped them dead in their tracks. And this guy hated Calvin. And I don't know that Calvin knew that he would back down. Because these men came for a fight and these, these, these were soldiers. So, uh, it wasn't, it wasn't a bed of roses for Calvin as he ministered uh, with the unconverted. Um, and after, um, after, that was really toward the very end of the Libertines. They were, uh, they were desperate. They had lost their power. This was their last attempt. And after that, in, after 1559, uh, they really did lose their power. But I think it was Calvin's decisive action that day, literally risking his life, for peace in the city that it was brought about. So, uh, I don't know if that was what you might have been referring to. Yes? Thanks so much for telling about the, um, that kind of pastoral side of Calvin, this book selling and stuff. I, I, I didn't know any of that. And people definitely don't think of that when they think of Calvin and Calvinism. Um, the blood-soaked nightgowns really gives a pretty uh, different perspective on what's involved with being a pastor's wife. Um, my question is, what was the personality of those, those pastors that perished? Um, what was the personality of Calvinism in the 1500s? Uh, the reason I'm asking is because in 2017, um, the personality of Calvinism, depending on the church and the denomination, I don't want to make a uh, blanket statement, but my experience with the Reformed community is that it's not always very winsome or welcoming, um, present company accepted. Um, but uh, what, what was it like then? 
Uh, I mean, clearly it was sacrificial, it was courageous. Um, Calvin tried to collaborate with Lutheranism, so there was a sense of uh, collaboration there, maybe. Um, again, that's not a word that comes to mind today for me, for the Reformed tradition. With, and I'm not saying that's true across the board, there are some exceptions. But my question is, what was the personality like then compared to what personality and the kind of the landscape of Calvinism now today? Yeah, I, I think it's very, very difficult for us to make a side-by-side -side comparison. I, I think there's more cultural discontinuity than continuity, and so uh, for me, it's next to impossible to say, well, here's the way it was, and here's the way it is, and we should be more like that, or that should be more like this, because, again, Geneva was officially entirely Protestant. So the Libertines had no legal right to oppose what was going on. Uh, and it was, uh, Geneva was a city, and we talk about Winsome. So we know the population numbers. The, the population of Geneva nearly tripled during Calvin's ministry. Tripled. So, I mean, again, think of you know, your hometown and triple the population over a 20 year period. So it was a massive increase, and these were all refugees. So uh, you, uh, you've got this, the economic problems, the political problems, the social problems. I mean, just uh, the stresses on a city of an increased population, increased, and more mouths to feed, uh, uh, late, uh, finding work. So for example, uh, uh, many English Protestants during the time of the Queen Mary, we call the Bloody Mary, uh, found a home in Switzerland, whether it's Geneva or Basel or Zurich, um, and did all kinds of different things to uh, try to make a living. So, uh, indubitably, we were winsome, but we're winsome because we're inviting brothers in who, if we don't invite them in, they'll die. So, I mean, it, it is self-evident when a woman is a widow, she's, she's sacrificed all for the sake of Christ. Of course she let her in. But the same would apply to a, a John Knox or a, you know, many of the refugees uh, had to come because remember you're under bad Lord Mark and if you, he'll kill you if you stay in his territory. So what do you do? You escape for your life. Where are you going to go? You go to Geneva. So we just don't have that in the United States at least. That doesn't mean we don't have it in other parts of the world. Uh, you know, things are different in China yeah. uh, in other parts. But here, here in America, no one's going to die because they're Catholic or because they're Reformed, at least not yet. Yeah. So it's really hard for me to make that kind of comparison. Yeah. Yes, sir? The French Huguenots, did they flee at that time to Florida? And yeah, so, uh, so Calvin uh, is dead in 1564. We've got the St. Bartholomew's Day Massacre at the end of the 16th century. Uh, and small enclaves of the French Huguenot continued, but uh, many of them in the 1700s then came to the United States. So you've got uh, and, uh, many of the people who have French last names uh, or French Union, you know. but some also went to uh, Germany and uh, to Holland um, as well. Um, so there was a, uh, the majority of the French Union you know, had to flee uh, out of France, uh, but a, a few were able to stay. Um, and many uh, of our early settlers uh, were French and then were also Protestant, which meant they were human. Did they assimilate it to other uh, Because I don't hear of that. Yeah, so, so for example, uh, many of them went to Holland and became what we would call Dutch Reformed or German Reformed. Um, so in Emden and different places like that, there were significant French populations. Um, and they, they assimilated into the culture of either the Germanic speaking or the Dutch speaking and stopped speaking French even though their last names are French. Other questions on what we've seen so far relative to the persecution particularly? Yes? Um, where you're done, are 
what happened to you? Sure, sure, I'll do that. Yeah, if, will you remind me if I forget? Well, uh, for me as a Presbyterian, uh, Presbyterianism really was birthed in Calvin's Geneva. John Knox, a Scotsman, had uh, left uh, England because of the persecution under Mary and was trained in Calvin's Geneva and then took, uh, uh, took what he learned in terms of social and political change. He was uh, completely convinced of the need for uh, Protestantism to not just uh, change the religious life of men and women, but to go for a radical reformation of the whole of life. And uh, for me as a Presbyterian, a Scottish Presbyterian background, uh, my, uh, you know, my heritage really goes back, uh, as, a, as a Scotsman, back to Geneva. So uh, we're thankful for what happened uh, in Geneva uh, in terms of the spread, uh, taking care of the refugees and then the refugees going back. And many of the uh, English Puritans were trained in Calvin's, in Calvin's Geneva. So uh, the story then uh, through Calvin's life uh, was a story of struggle theological struggle, uh, political struggle, um, uh, but the establishment of the uh, city and the establishment of the public school and the establishment, and again, think of the social problem. If, if your population has tripled and you've got the refugees' children, the Genevan citizens had to pay the taxes to train the refugees' children through the Genevan public education. So it was a there's a burden on the whole city to take in these refugees. And uh, the word winsome is way too mild to see how uh, the city of Geneva embraced uh, the refugee populations. And uh, Calvin had a second in charge, Theodore Beza, who continued Calvin's work. Beza died in 1605. And uh, Calvin's last edition of the Institutes came out in 1559. It was... Um, written in both Latin and French, sold thousands and thousands of copies around the world. But Heinrich Bullinger, Zwingli's successor, was actually more popular in England than Calvin. Um, Bullinger wrote a, a, a theological work called The Decades, which was a series of his sermons. And it was more popular, actually, than Calvin's Institutes in England. And nevertheless, uh, the Institutes were translated into into French and uh, spread uh, the Reformed religion so that immediately before the uh, St. Bartholomew's Day Massacre, it is estimated that 80% of the population of France had been converted. So it was a time um, of success under tremendous pain and persecution. And uh, to close, and then have some minutes for questions, to close, uh, Geneva became uh, more and more solidified in terms of its uh, international presence and until about 1750. So the present day University of Geneva was established during this time. But in about 1750, uh, liberalism, theological liberalism began to take hold and that was the beginning of the end of, uh, of a strict Calvinism uh, in Geneva, so it lasted till about 1750, approximately. Well, I'd love to uh, uh, spend more time with you. In the, right before we began, I was joking uh, with Dr. Larson as to how long this lecture should last, two or three hours, and he said it's fine with him, but it would be just the two of us. <laughs> so uh, I promised to uh, finish by two o'clock, and there's a few minutes uh, for further questions or comments. The floor is open. Yes, ma'am. So, why, in your opinion, did the uh, Reformed side of Protestantism not make it to Denmark, Sweden, and Norway? Well, uh, uh, the answer, I think, is uh, political. Uh, uh, they were connected uh, geographically, politically, with the Holy Roman Empire. Um, so, uh, it was the Germanic. Uh, powers uh, that were more important in uh, in the you know in Norway, Sweden, and Denmark uh, than the uh, than the French 
powers. Um, so I think it, it was more political and cultural uh, trade. Trade was an important way for the spread of ideas, and uh, trade was more with the German powers than with the, uh, the French powers at that time in, in Scandinavia. But that's a short answer to a uh, more complex question. Is that good enough? Would you like a follow-up? Yeah, yeah, I was just, um, parts of Germany were reformed at this time, too. Right? Yes, um, but they were, again, we think about the Heidelberg. 1563, why is the Heidelberg invented? Well, because being reformed in Germany was illegal. And so the Heidelberg Catechism was, in a, in a sense, a way to show, look, we're just good Christians. And uh, so it had, a, uh, it had a polemic edge to it as well. And uh, again, the RCUS is uh, the denomination of German reform, which is almost oxymoronic. Uh, we think of German Luther. Um, so uh, uh, reform, German reform uh, in 1563 was still illegal. So, would you like another follow-up? Okay. Yes, sir. Servetus, so yeah. Uh, he was a genius. He was really a genius. He um, was physician to the king of France. Uh, uh, medical historians say that he beat that guy named Harvey in discovering the circulation of blood by the heart. I don't know. Uh, but he was absolutely a genius in terms of his medical knowledge. But he was also a genius theologian. And he wrote a book with the title Institutes in it. It was almost as big as, well, it was as big as Calvin's first edition. And it was an anti-Trinitarian institutes. So it's the institutes of a non-Trinity Christian religion. And it was like, uh, it was the apex of heresy. So Servetus had been condemned to death by the Roman Catholic Church as soon as that book came out. And, uh, Again, in the 16th century, to be anti-Trinitarian is absolutely to be a heretic. And there's only uh, one thing to do with heretics. You have to kill them. So Servetus had been condemned to death by everybody. Now, Servetus and Calvin had actually corresponded. And do you remember that Calvin was condemned to death in France? Serve uh, Calvin tried to uh, convince Servetus to give up his heresy. Servetus said, I'm inclined to agree with you. Will you meet with me and talk face to face? Calvin said, you tell me when I'll be there. So he says, how about Paris? So Calvin went. He snuck into Paris to meet with Servetus. He, he went to the place, the agreed meeting, and Servetus never showed up. So he risked his own life. So they, uh, again, what I'm sharing, we have the letters. So they wrote some more letters back and forth. And Calvin then became convinced that there was, uh, there was no way Servetus was going to change his mind. So Calvin said, you have to understand, uh, so he was uh, imprisoned in France, condemned to death, but escaped because he was wealthy enough to pay a bribe to get out. So Calvin wrote to him and said, if you ever do come to Geneva, I can't promise you protection because he's being hunted. I won't protect you if you come to Geneva. Calvin is in the pulpit on a Sunday morning, preaching away. Some idiot stands up and starts yelling at him. It's Servetus. Right in the middle of the service. So he's immediately arrested. And Calvin goes to him in jail. And again, we have the records of all this. We, we know how many times he visited Servetus in jail. He said, what are you doing? So the guy was nuts. I mean, he was way too smart. And um, <laughs> so he's condemned by the city council. Remember, Calvin is not a citizen of Geneva. He had no vote in the city council. They vote to burn him alive. We have the letter to the city council from Geneva saying, have mercy on this guy. Uh, I'm in favor of his execution, but uh, do it swiftly. Um, so he suggested having his head cut off instead, which is the, 
that's the most humane way of execution. So the Swiss Reformed, uh, the cities of the Swiss Reformed, all um, were asked their opinion, what should we do with Servetus? And it was a unified opinion. All the Protestants thought that he should be put to death. So uh, is Calvin responsible for Servetus' execution? Yes. Um, so is the Roman Catholic Church. So were all the Protestant Reformed churches. And it was the 16th century, and that's what you did. And it doesn't make it right, but that's the historical situation. Any other questions? It's a little after two, but I, uh, I get paid by the hour, so I can uh, <laughs> I can be here as long as you'd like. <laughs> oh yeah, oh yeah, I forgot. <laughs> Any other questions? Yes, I see one. The green shirt. In the Catholic Church? So, yes. I only have two minutes, huh? So, uh, after Luther died, there was a meeting in the city of Trent in Italy of the theologians of the Catholic Church, and the meeting is called the Council of Trent. And the Council of Trent was the operative uh, theology of the Roman Catholic Church until the Second Vatican Council, well, the First Vatican Council in the 19th century in the second and the twentieth. So uh, for, uh, for many hundreds of years, the Council of Trent was the operative theology. And uh, uh, the Council of Trent is really, a, it's really bad. Um, our Protestant faith is condemned. Um, so uh, according to the Council of Trent, all of us go to hell. Um, uh, so justification by faith alone is called a damnable heresy. Um, so there's, uh, they made sure, point for point for point, with both Lutheran and, and Calvinist teaching, that there's no possible reconciliation between the two communions. Um, uh, we should die. Now that changed with the First Vatican and changed again with the Second Vatican, where Luther is called an erring brother now. Um, so he's recognized as a Christian and not as a heretic um, since the 1960s. Um, but up until the 1960s, um, that was the official position of the Roman Church, the Council of Trent. Would you like a follow-up on that? That was a complex question that I gave very short answer to. Now I saw one other hand, and this will be the last one. Tom You're good? Well, then I think we're done. Thank you very much. Thank you.